let's go. Let's try to monitor just after this excellent lunch. So um, what we will try to do is we try to present you your know, best practices in research management, research data management, and uh, the H twenty twenty context around that. Um, then we will talk about data management plan DMD, and I will try to present you a you know pretty simple approach to give up one, and uh, we will I will give you a, a case and try to show you that it's not so complex to, uh, to develop. And at the end, we will uh, have a look at the impact services. Okay, so just quick information uh, on CNES, which is one of the French uh, national center for, uh, for IT. We are, based in, uh, <coughs> we are based in Montpellier in South of France. Um, three main activities, so HPC, and we have one of the we have one uh, phrase tier one system which is uh, for oxygen and which is 3.5 teraflops. Uh, digital preservation, and I will come back to that later in the presentation, and also hosting for some uh, members of our community. Okay, so um, I'm working at CNES since uh, 2013. Uh, I've been involved in digital preservation and now in HPC, so. I'm involved in both, uh, both sides. And regarding the EU project, I'm involved in both UDAT and PRACE. Okay, so on PRACE, I'm reading there is a task focusing on collaboration with other infrastructure and center of excellence, meaning UDAT is one of them, obviously, but also GIANT and uh, EGI, and I hope soon is the COEs. And on UDAT, I'm working on the collaboration with PRACE. So an easy one. Uh, just to let you know, my background is not in research, but more in um, information system and project program management. So, UDAT. Quick overview of what is UDAT. Really, uh, UDAT started in, um, not in 2020, but on the previous, uh, the previous course in 2012, I think it's safe. Uh, and really seeing that all the research infrastructure are facing some big data challenges. Okay, so a lot of data to store, difficult to find them, how to use them, and so on. So, UNAT intention has been to provide some pan European level solutions. Okay, and really to work on trying to offer some services that are, you know, common to many communities. Okay, with the objective to provide some integration. So, as I have quite a lot of slides, and I would like to also spend a bit of time on trying to do some exercises and get you involved into that, I will go pretty quickly. Uh, some of the slides I left in the presentation will be available for reading. Feel free to interrupt me anyway if you, <coughs> if you find something uh, not easy to understand. So, you don't. Uh, as 35 partners on the current project. They are both data centers. So for example, like uh, we have uh, Jewish, uh, Chineka, Sines, Edouard, BSC, so some of the main uh, European data centers, GRNet, uh, and some other. But also some communities, okay? For example, um, DKRZ is for the, the climate community, Ines, uh, ENGB for EPOS, so all sorts of things. And really, UDAT intention has been to build services uh, with the communities. So the communities defining their requirement, data center building solutions with them. Okay, and really the idea is to offer this pan European uh, infrastructure. So, really, what the result of that, and I will present you a bit later on the services provided by UDAT, but they are all named collaborative data infrastructure. It means that services are spread. All over Europe in the different centers. So, price and UDAT collaboration, something I said I'm involved in to that. So, what we have done so far is uh, we started with some joint open, open calls. Uh, basically, as part of price, for those who know price, price is uh, running some calls uh, for price and also taking calls to access some tier one resources. Um, 
during those calls, you got offered uh, access to its services, okay, obviously to some data storage. Uh, and with, as part of the review process, we selected some, some data pilots, okay, we have been running five of them so far, but we have still some more to, to go. And for someone who got uh, allocated, you know, some uh, trace CPU uh, hours during the year, you that was offering an additional two years of uh, access to the data services for the data. Okay, so it was quite interesting. Why doing that? And I will use a lot of the learnings from those pilots when uh, presenting you the, you know, data management plan and how to uh, to create them. We identified that there was a real need for joint training activities. Okay, here we go. <laughs> That's one uh, we have now. So we're trying to make sure that we can deliver some user training as during trace events and vice versa. So, for example, there will be a, a UDA summer school in Crete in July, and uh, there will be some trace uh, training. There. Okay, and we keep going. On, we keep going on uh, around that, knowing that one of the Big challenge we have for uh, infrastructure integration is around authentication, credentials, and so on. To make sure that you know there is some kind of smooth integration and seamless integration. So, first question for me, just one, one precise answer, obviously, but if some of you can uh, have an idea of take any of your HPC uh, project you're involved with at the moment and uh, you just tell me what are give me examples of data related requirements you have on, on that. <coughs> not your voice. <laughs> you're not you're not allowed to answer. <laughs> so um, anything well usually on that on HPC project you have some data somewhere. Okay. So any example, any idea, please participate. <laughs> if not it's <laughs> I can maybe make an example. What about this motivation for the others? Yes. Yeah? Yes. Okay. So, um, data related requirements. So, it's about the thing we have seen yesterday classification using an HPC code to support major machines. And the data related requirement would be that I just take satellite data that many others have used before, but I search it somewhere in some folder where I have no idea where it is. So it would be better that it would be shared with the other one that also we're going to do. So that would be my requirement should be shareable so that you know other PhD students can directly access it instead of searching for others having no way that it. When it comes to budget, of course I would say as a professor, it's a PhD student budget. Not much more I want to say it's a PhD thesis. And the others? Yeah, let me see. Do you know where Rob? I'm sure you're part of the simulation, you produce some results and so on, so you produce some data. <coughs> do we have plans to store them? Usually, or do we have budget to store them? I can tell you what I got from the, when we are creating the trade, the, you know, the, the ULAP data pilot, the trace ULAP data pilot, most of the requirements were, well, we have this amount of terabyte to store and to transfer. This I usually get, and usually a lot of details regarding the, um, you know, the transfer protocol and things like that. But I never really saw anything around budget and so on. So, so nobody is telling us has to do with data so far? Or no shy? Everybody's been in data. Sorry? Everybody's been in data. Everybody's been in data. Yes, I'm sure. Okay. But, okay. Let's come back to that. <laughs> okay, so just quick uh, words around uh, something you probably heard about, but we know this example of big data explosion, it's uh, we are creating more and more data, and so if you take any, any kind of scope. Let's focus on research data, but uh, I quite like that question. It's from three to four years ago, but um, okay, we are creating more data in the year, and, the amount of data that was created before the, uh, the production of data and it's probably more than that now. Okay, so um, data loss. Okay, so 
The other one slide has a list of potential reasons to lose data. I like some of them. We, we usually, well, it's quite easy to think about disaster, you know, natural disaster, the failure in the storage, and so on. But we have a lot of other causes. And this one, and we'll come back to that one, format obsolescence. Are you able to read something that was created 10 years ago? Depends. <laughs> OK. Loss of staffing competency. Usually, you have you run your project. If the, if the project team is still around, if there are still some PhD students working on that, you keep some knowledge, but hmm, maybe not later. Uh, financial stability. Okay, as I read already the, the reason of the budget. It's one storage is expensive, okay, and need to be maintained. Okay, so all sorts of reasons for data to be uh, to be loose. So we create a lot of data. If we create those data, there is value attached to those data. It would be great to back to lose them. Okay, that's a quick example around, uh, it was a, a study around URL decay and, uh, you know, the fact that basically you can find a lot of URLs somewhere, but if they are quite old, I'm not sure that we point you to the right, uh, or to the expected reason. So, good reasons to manage your data. So why would we manage some data? Okay, so we have here again a set of reasons to make re your research easier. Well, you might not be sure, but probably. Um, in case you need the data later, that's interesting. You have run something, if you want to reuse them, that would be great to find them somewhere. Avoid accusations of fraud or bad science. It's always good to be able to prove that the data you use are coming from. Well, where they come from, what is their provenance, and things like that. Share data, well, that's good. Get credit for producing it, so I think it's important. Okay. They've been working quite a, quite a lot. So. And something that will become more and more important, because funder of your organization require it. Okay. Um, when managed data opens some opportunity, for sure, uh, we saw that. Bad, badly managed data can, can cost us. So, we talked about the funder. So, one of our funder is the European Commission, H2020. Uh, created a few years ago, oh, sorry, created an open research data pilot. Okay? So, initially, and, uh, initially you had a, for some specific areas. There was the possibility to have open data pilot, okay, so to have for projects, okay, for 2020 projects. It was free to to uh, to do or not. From now on, uh, it has been expanded to all work areas. And it's really the, the direction is that any H2020 project will have to prove it manages its data. Okay. The guidance is to consider which data can be made open, and that, that sentence is quite important. It's as open as possible, as closed as necessary. That's really the guidance provided by the Commission. Okay, you, find, you can find all sorts of documentation, I'll give you some links for that. Okay, and now uh, what has been pushed forward is really this approach to a fair data management. Findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And that's what we're going to talk a bit more in the, in the coming slides. OK, so those are the requirements for those open data pilots. Uh, extended, as I said already, uh, you have to deposit data in a research data repository of your choice. OK, there's nothing they you have to use this and that, but you need to have what? Um, ensure that others can access, mine, exploit, reproduce, and disseminate the data free of charge. Free of charge. So, so that's quite uh, important. And obviously, provide information that will be necessary to use to make use of it. Okay. So um, that's what you. Have as a project uh, member, you have to do, okay? 
This is the link to a really good document presenting, uh, summarizing all of this. Okay. I invite you to read it. It's not that long. It includes also a data management plan template and uh, guidelines to, to write one. So, I talk about a data management plan. So, that's actually the, the document. So, that is a document that will include the description of all those open data related data management. Uh, related actions. So basically, it will provide information on it. the data the research we generate, we use, actually, not only generate, we can see that uh, we also need to use some, some data as well as we generate some. Uh, do we describe how it will be curated, preserved, and how you will ensure sustainability over time? Okay. And we also have to describe what parts of the data will be made open and how it is. So, um, to you about the data management plan, what, what I will ask you to do, and I'm sure you have in some paper and pen, so get ready because I will like you to work a bit. Oh, I'm not on that, I mean, there, there was in the, <laughs> in the folder I provided, if you have some, at least see to that. So, quite often, Show you this. about this document, which is the uh, actuality program guideline on fair data management in Horizon 2020. That's the document that was uh, provided the link to. Okay. So we have a description of the, of the data, of data management plan and so on. And then you have some kind of a template. Okay. So it gives you a template. I don't want to stop you too much, but when you go to that template, it's, I mean, it's well structured as a delivery, okay? But it doesn't give you properly the way to, to create it and something like that. So what I'll be trying to show you is based on my experience and the experience we have on those pre-sular data files is to um, suggest you a way to build the data management plan. So, um, the first step, we we'll come back to that, I will detail what you see on those steps. It's basically you, an HPC project uh, manages some data, and this is an information system. Okay. I take it, and that means that you have, you have information going, you know, being managed, being transferred, being transformed, and so on. Okay, so, I really suggest that a good start is to describe that, and I will suggest one type of diagram, which is the data flow diagram. Okay. Then, as I said, you will need to apply some of the, the FAIR principles findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable. So these are the most guidelines, and they are really uh, useful. We'll get into the details. One thing with research data, well, with all sorts of data, is that you have time dimension. Okay. Your data will start to be create them at some point and they will leave. They will, at some point you will need to maybe uh, how can I say you, you will need to create them, you will need to transform, at some point you will be able to publish them, at some point you will be able to destroy them or you need to preserve them. Okay, so that's something important to, to, uh, to include in your uh, data management plan. And at some point, you will need to provide cost. That's a requirement from the functions and uh, from the European Commission, for example, is that you will need to estimate cost, and by the way, you will be able to get some funding for that, which is important. Because usually, you can, well, quite often, the National Research Center, which is kind of offering you some storage space and so on. Well, true, but this has some limitation. The volume is increasing and uh, the storage cost doesn't decrease that much. Okay? And what I suggest is that you have to iterate. Okay? It's difficult to create something from scratch and a perfect data management plan. Usually the suggestion is to say, well, when you create your project, you will draft something, you will create an initial version. 
then the, the commission suggests that after six months you have to, de to deliver a more uh, complete version. Okay, so it's probably the first cycle of iteration. Um, but for sure, as you will at some point, so submit the proposal, get the get the funder support, and everything you need. But then you will have to maintain uh, your data management plan all, all during the duration of the project and maybe a bit further. Okay, because you will at some point find that uh, what, what you are planning to do is done slightly differently, that the data are slightly different, or you will get some uh, further requirements. Okay, so. Um, as I said, data flow diagram, it's a pretty simple diagram. Okay. Um, you can use some others, but that's what we're going to use. I will give you a case, just in one or two slides, and I will ask you to try to draw something. So it's quite easy. It's, you have some data processing. Okay, I transfer data. I run a simulation, something like that. You have this uh, symbol for data store where I store this data, or this is the storage in my HPC center, or something like that. And you have a data flow that's where you show with an arrow that where this data is going from, let's say, that storage to that data processing, and, and so on. Okay, so it's quite useful because by doing that, you should be able to represent all the data, where they come from, where they go, and so on, and that's sometimes quite useful to end up on the diagram. So, that's what we're going to do, pretty simple. So, now there's some exercise. So, if you can, if you have a bit of, uh, and we will try to do so, what, what are the next two we go through together? There's no good or bad answer, okay, to it. I just, uh, just would like you to try, try to draw, we can and we do that on the, on the whiteboard together. To, um, for that case, which is not, scientifically perfect, okay, that's definitely not the case, but to create the data flow diagram, fill the data summary, so there's a, that's the first chapter of the of the data management plan, okay, we should, that's a table, I will show you the format, and we will have another question. So, um, the case is, I took an example, okay, smart cities and so on, uh, the city we call it the city, um, as some sensors, they measure traffic, you know, we don't take us uh, per hour, there are various numbers. This exists actually. Um, so, you want to, you are submitting a proposal to build, a, you know, an application, being able to forecast this the traffic, okay, and how it will be impacted by events like planned good works and so That's the case. You would run that on a price site, which is not located uh, in the city. You have some limitation in the uh, regarding your storage space on, on price. That's uh, real life. <laughs> um, and so your application will use some inputs. Okay, so you use the sensor data uh, for the last 12 months. They produce one terabyte a day to sensors. Uh, so you probably have to, you, you will need to implement a preprocessing module, translating those data into a reduced data set. So basically you have defined the format to do that, which is just a description. From all those sensors, you just extract the data you need to model to, to give you the... the, the, the this I call this is the 100 time. It's not a comp it's, it, it's an extraction. It's not only a compressor, I don't know for that, but we assume that you, you, you have a reduced data, you have a reduced data set, okay? Uh, your simulation, your simulation will, will provide some results, and you will reuse those results, so probably some kind of machine learning type of uh, type of application, okay? Well, you will also use some of the weather data. You assume there is a, an impact of weather around that, so they are provided by you know your national meteor agency, and they use a signal format. Which is a way to format <laughs> data, uh, negligible volume, okay, and you want the, the, the city council employees to access the, the results. So, 
just would like to, based on that description, to try to draw, and you have, you have the symbols here, to try to draw a bit the, what would be the, the data flow diagram format. Complex. So you have some, you have some papers, or you should have in the, in the folder, or? <laughs> Or you use the mount the mount was part. So feel free to ask me any question. If you bring it up, we can go together on the. Now, spend a few, just a few minutes to try to uh, represent that, okay? Then we can we can do it together. Just one, just one is that example to show that it's a good way to start and that can help you to then uh, identify the data sets and all the things we need to uh, capture in the, in the table and later on in the data management. Sorry? Financial point for the project as well. Financial point. No, 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 no. no. Just, just focus on, on representing the. The, how the data will flow, you know. So the data set So if, if it's, you start from, let, let's assume that I give you the start. The starting point, you will have the data storage, which is the, which contains all the sensors, and raw data. That's probably the, that's probably the starting point. No, no, no the, in the table, data set, it means a metadata description. No, no, forget that. We, we, come, we, we come to that table later. Mm -hmm. Just focus on the data flow diagram to start with. No, that the data set is not uh, it's not in the database. Not necessary. Yes. The initial input is one terabyte of data available. Yes. And after I implement the process module, it's reduced to ten megabytes. Yes. So from one Terabyte. You extract one you extract ten megabytes of the this is all I need. Yes. This is all you need. Yes. Just for the sake of the exercise if you need to. We can go through, I can I can show you a bit of and we come back to the data so what? something I put together okay I might be able to present it but I think that, that, that will work so I'm assuming you have the raw sensor data available somewhere okay as I said it's on the data city it's in the city your data center so you have a data process which is your data pre-processing it's something you have to implement creating the reduced sensor data Okay, so this you use a data transfer tool, okay, that will bring you that will bring those data into the praise data storage. As I said, uh, usually the, the HPC site is not located in the, close to the sensors and so on, so you are quite often as to transfer data. Okay, you, you bring that into the praise storage. You also, we said we, we also need the weather data. Okay, so they come from usually you have uh, and you can find most of the Meteorological agency, they have some open data platforms and so on, so you can get data and you can extract that. So I'm assuming there is an extractor. Okay. Bringing also those data, the one I want, into the pre storage. Okay. And then I run simulations, so I have input file, creating output file, going into the into the storage. That's it really. That's what I that's that's the thing I described. Okay? So now that you are represented, but now one more question. Yes, please. Uh, this weather data must be synchronized with the sensor data in time. Yes. 
you, you obviously you well yes I didn't I didn't put those effects. Okay, I don't. Uh, I won't focus really on what is the simulation and so on. Okay, I'm really focusing on the the data uh, flowing around. Okay, so yes, you can imagine that you want to know, but that's something interesting when we discuss the data description, the data, and so on. Obviously, you need to. Well, you can imagine that the the traffic can be impacted by the, by the weather. If it's heavily raining, usually the traffic is not as good as when the sun is shining and so on and so forth. If you, if you have snow, also some time. Yes? Yeah. Uh, one question the late transfer. Is there some processing going on there? Or why don't we have like a direct flow from the reduced data set to the brain storage? Like, uh, is, is there something else, another component in there? Yeah, I mean, here again, it's depends on your project what you do. Okay? But as I said, I took I took I made the assumption that you are collecting the you are collecting that the, the there is a place where the, the, the data yeah, it's a different data center. So yes. It's okay. a different data center. So yeah, yeah. what I don't want to do is I want to pre-process the data yeah. at yeah. this location to yeah. avoid the yeah, huge data transfer. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm just asking like the there the uh, Sort of the data class, but yeah. there's some some additional processing going on there, or I don't know, right. some mm -hmm. architectural activity or whatever. No, I mean, I mean, it, I mean, it depends. Here again, it depends. Okay, I, I won't go into that detail, but it might happen. But actually, by drawing some kind of a diagram like that, you can ask those questions, and then obviously it depends on your project. Maurice? Yeah, I, I like the diagram very much. You should do much more than of this. My question would be basically or stimulate the discussion of the input files and output files. In a sense, there would be also data. Yeah. Isn't it? If you think oh, yes. the submission data, the yes. and could have put the, the, the could have say input data or input data, obviously, yes. Something like this, yeah. But then yes, because then obviously if you can if you want to if you, if you dig a bit more into that, you will find what kind of data you need and so on. That's I mean, here again, for instance. I mean, this is of course very much for HPC specific, but of course for others to reproduce the data with parameters, it could be data. For example, what valuable data you have as input files, not into just the data set, also the kind of job scripts and such like Job scripts, parameters, and so on. Well, here, here I, made, I made the simple assumption that the input files are. You know, coming from the from the sensor, the weather data, and some uh, and the results also, and probably you have multiple simulation. Okay. Sure. Just, just Sorry. These yes. methods that, 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 that after data transfer, this data must be in the form of which are be recognizable by this application. Yes, simulation. Yeah. Yes. Or the best simulation requires another data bridging. Uh, and data mining uh, on activity. Maybe, maybe, maybe you're right. But that, so that's where we go to the next to the next one, which is from that. Okay, as you said, we can we can define. Okay, uh, we can start to fill a table like this one. Okay, so I basically, basically took the you know the data management plan template, and these are the questions you are asked. It's to identify your data sets. Okay, so. Data set is a set of data. Well, good. <laughs> Doesn't describe much more. This is where you have to identify, okay, which group of data you are handling uh, in that part of this uh, project information system, call it whatever you want. Okay, so the idea is for them to say, okay, well, put a description. Interesting question around, okay, where do they come from? Are they existing or do I create them as part of the as part of the, the project? Okay. What is the format? So that's the question you were you were raising. What is the size? And something already important, which is who could use it. Okay, so this one might be a bit more tricky at this point, uh, but really well on the example we can do that. So let's do it together. You have the you have the columns here. So I'm back to that. So what are my data sets when you look at that diagram? Sensor data. <laughs> yes, so you have the raw sensor data as well. Yes? Weather. 
So let's, let, for this one, more sensor data, where do they come from? Well, quite easy, from the sensors, they are, they are existing and so on. The format, I didn't give uh, any, any information, it's whatever format is available or can be. Usually it would be various different types of formats and so on. Okay. The size, I gave you the water, I think it's important because, um, you know, when, once you start to have the format, the size, you start to have an idea of uh, what you can do with them, by you know, identifying that. And for some of them, it's not totally written in the, <laughs> in the, in the exercise because it will be a real life project. Okay. So, next. Uh, set, next data set. You were saying some reduced sensor data. Yes, yes, this one. So I use the warning reduced sensor data, but they can be uh, actual tra actual traffic data. Yeah. Okay, so as I said, it's just I extracted something, so it's another data set. Okay, uh, origin existing, what is something I'm creating uh, from my uh, pre processing. Format, well, that's one the question you were asking. Cool, let's assume it's, I will assume for the moment it's a binary type of format and so on. Okay, uh, yes, uh, I have another question. This uh, uh, result data is produced only for this simulation or in the future may be used for exactly. another simulation? So we will, we will, that's the right question. But that's the next step. <laughs> so we, you're totally right, and that's something we will discuss. Uh, a bit in the second second phase of the exercise. Okay. So for the moment, take that as I, I took the example that it will be only uh, some binary specific data and so on. You, as you said, as you point, as you are pointing out, if we do in such a way that will be used, that will be available for others. Okay. So yes. Uh, next data set in the diagram. Yes, all of that. Weather data, obviously. So as I said, it's uh, weather data. They are existing, they are provided by the meteorological office. Format is, give you an example of CNOC, so it's a well described open format and, and so on. The size is small. But as you say, who could, who could use it? And this one, so for the meteorological data, it's easy. It's everybody interested. It's usually part of open data. And that was the same the question you asked for the reduced uh, Sensor data. So, based on the on the answer, we can obviously iterate and find and find the form. Another that was set. So data set provided to the council employers. So the results. The results exactly. Okay, the results. So here again, what they are, what are the results? They are forecast traffic data. Okay, and uh, okay. so basically that's what that's what you have on the. On this table, okay. Here again, I took I took the the assumption at this point in time that who could use the the actual traffic? It's only our simulation. Uh, the result was frequency employee and our simulation. That's obviously not uh, what we what we have. Okay, so this would be some kind of the first step to create your data management plan. Okay, it's pretty, you, you can apply that to a lot of areas and by doing through iterations, you can start defining your project. Obviously, you can understand that when you initiate a project or when you submit a proposal, you might not have the full details, but you will reach a certain point and actually you will have ideas. Just something like, you know, the volumes and so on might be useful to estimate you know, storage, requirements, and so a bit, coming back to a bit more, uh, you know, theory information, and then we continue with the exercise. Thanks. So um, one thing I won't go, I won't go into the full detail, and you will be able to read, but this diagram is quite nice, showing that, you know, there is a data life cycle. You create, you process, analyzing, preserving, giving access, reusing. So this is something you will find with most of the research data. It doesn't necessarily go through exactly the same order, the same steps, and so on. But you know that your data will 
we leave we, we go through those different uh, steps. And coming back to so something which is pretty key, as I said in uh, Action 2020 recommendation, is to follow the FAIR principle. So we give you a link here with uh, this on this site, and we get clear definition of the FAIR uh, principles. I will show you uh, some details a bit in a few slides. But it's really good. It's, uh, there is also a, um, a good article that was published in Nature around those data and this data management. So it's really quite universal a principle okay, for research data management, but for data management in general, in my sense, not only research. So what does FEM tell you? Okay. Tells you that data will be findable. So to do that, you can go through persistent IDs, rich metadata, need to register in a searchable resource. Okay. So do you know what is a persistent ID? PIDs, what we call PIDs, DOI. 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 DOI is a, is a persistent ID. Okay. Basically, that's, that is to avoid what, what, what I was showing regarding the URL, uh, not pointing to the right resources and so on. Okay. This is an identifier that will really remain persistent over time. Okay. And uh, the person managing those identifiers will guarantee that you will always find your uh, document data, digital object, whatever it is, uh, when, you go to, when, when you use one. Not to solve. Um, you're done. So you need to be able to find your data. You should be able to access it. Okay, so where here we you see we use the we, we can use the ID, okay, we find it. So find, by finding it uh, using some uh, metadata, you can get the ID. From the ID, you can use a standard protocol, okay, uh, to get the data, to download the data, to read them, okay. Uh, something interesting. Metadata remain accessible if data are not accessible. Okay. We'll come back to that, but you might have something like, well, for example, if you have some personal data into your data set, maybe you won't be allowed to, uh, to, make, to make that data set open. Okay. But nothing is stopping you to provide metadata and say, hey, that exists and so on. Maybe under certain conditions, talk to us, we can give you access. Or just I, have, I face some example of people saying, well, we don't want to make the data totally open, but if someone, we want to discuss with the person, know what they want to do, spend some time, but so we can provide the metadata. We can publish the metadata. It's like so you mentioned the scientific uh, articles, which are not all, not all open access. Mm -hmm. There's only extra, which is not some kind of metadata. But if you want to get a full good data, you need to pay. Yeah, that's, a, that, that's an example. You know, by definition, we talk about data, and you can see that it's a bit more than data. You can fly that to some kind of Interoperable, here we talk about um, format. Okay. When we talk about format, so it's really something which is an open format, something you can read and so on. And reusable. Uh, well, reusable means that uh, someone else can use it. You can use it for other people, someone else. So, well, something important, we talk about licenses. Okay, so you need to say, well, this is open, this is such a license apply, and so on. Uh, you obviously need enough metadata for the other person to understand, and so on. And so on. So I will give you a little bit more into that. Something really, really important. Fair for matching for machines as well as people. So we have more and more data being created, being available, and you you need to assume that you go with that it was not human who will be able to read and to search into those data and so on. You want some uh, automated processes to go to search for the data and so on. Okay, that's really, that's really important. So 
when you when you build that, and that's one of the, the foundation of the fair principle is to ensure that this will work for machine as well as for humans. Something important we talk about uh, when we are talking about data and so on. So we now use digital aspect as the example. Okay. So usually what you will uh, that's what you do, the unit you will handle any kind of data in the data management. So a digital object is made of a big string of the data. A persistent identifier. Okay. And some metadata. Okay, we will have some more information on metadata. So that's an example of uh, that we do share, and I will show you another one. And there's also this, okay, we won't spend too much time on that, but digital object can be aggregated in digital collections. Okay, so we took another example of data, so I will show it to you because I know the author. <laughs> So, we talked about those data yesterday. Yes, exactly. That's what we are looking at. Okay. And at, this is the P2Share application. We explain what is this that service that you can use to, to publish your uh, software, preserve and publish your data. Okay, so what you have here is the description of the data, you have some metadata. If you see, so the author and so on, uh, the abstract, some keywords, the PID, so persistent identifier. This is one, this is the standard one offered by, uh, by Viva, which is uh, the under PID. And then, you will see that. So you have some, uh, you have some. Metadata, okay, it's open access. So no license from, okay, so we are assuming it's open. Uh, <laughs> okay, contact email, publication dates, some category, and so on and so forth. And here I just wanted to show you that uh, it's a digital object. Okay, it doesn't mean that it's only one file. Okay, you have a set of data files. I'm thinking of this one, but that's really interesting. And if I go further, I'm sure I well, I didn't get into the detail, but there is the, probably the, the job. Yeah, and that's the sure. sub The submission script, the, the result script, and so on. And here, yeah, we can do this one. So yeah, and it's just yeah. asking basically the top status. Yeah. It's finished. No, which nodes it was running and stuff like this. Okay, so that's that means that with this digital object, okay, you have set, you have a bit stream, so you have some information that you that are meaningful if they are put together with some uh, you know the description that is in the PC, in the metadata. And the PID. So that's an example of a digital object. Okay. Obviously, this one fits uh, more with project, mm -hmm. okay, and that would be different for another project. No doubt, if you <coughs> use cloning and data, that would be a different structure and so on. And are there any searchable systems incorporated in this? Yes, is the answer. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, so, as I understand, you create uh, some kind of digital repository for the scientific data. Yes. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's one of the UDAT services. I will come back a bit later on to the, to the, to the UDAT services. Just to let you know, maybe just quickly on B2Share. B2Share is a, repos is a repository, but I, which I think I have written that in the, the next steps of the exercise. It's, it's a, a repository. Accessible to everybody, to be honest. You can go straight right now, create, create, store, uh, and archive some documents. So, where you can deposit some 
digital object. Okay, if you get your metadata, it will assign a persistent ID. Okay, and then you can uh, basically just show you, and you can then interface it there. Share. Okay, you can even create create a new record. Okay, so that means deposit something, or you can search something which is. I know that if I'm searching for you, but I'm, I'm most of the, of the documents provided, you know, to be by Boris. Yeah, now also the, the PhD student itself did it, Gabriel, for instance, you will find something about this. But maybe some motivation for doing this is also, if you remember yesterday we had a journal paper, like we submitted from the PhD student. Uh, yeah. And in our revenue process, we got very good remarks because in our references we really had concrete results. SPIDs reference to this kind of repository so that the reviewers could see, okay, we really have done the work. They could see everything. So the job scripts, input data, output data, how long it would take, right? If you benchmark things. And this is a, let's say, motivation for, let's say, everybody, so that in the review process it is appreciated. So in this sense, a PhD student normally wants to have access to the paper accepted. And, and also professors want to have that, so that's how it is motivated. One example, for instance. As I was said before, the professor give access to, uh, uh, to uh, approve this uh, method of this data. It is not available to this repository, yes? After only reviewing. No, 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 no. What I mean is, uh, I have a journal paper, and normally I put my results in, but I have no links to the data. I just say I did the work, which is fine, and the reviewers would believe that. But nowadays, everything is about open data, so people start asking questions where is the data? And we really use results. So you do your own homepage with slash for some journals, slash data for journal X. But using such a repository is nice because you have a PID, which is you know some all that will remain. So if a journal paper with six, seven references as a PID inside the journal paper itself. As if, if you would reference other journals, the same way you would reference, for instance, a PAD there. And it will remain forever because it has this interesting handle system. And then the reviewers will take your paper, will read through it, and you can reference, of course, your own data. And you already are one step ahead of a minor revision, for instance, from the journal paper, right? Because they have already access to the data. And as I said, in our case, it was really a positive remark we got from reviewers saying it was a good move to do that, which increases perhaps also the likelihood of acceptance. Okay, this is, this is, this is some kind of additional metadata to this scientific uh, uh, data, yes? Uh, yeah, or I would put it the other way around. The paper, which is just, just paper, mm -hmm. has no concrete substance basically there. It's concrete data and everything out there. Thank you. That was the digital object. Okay, so a bit of a bit around metadata. We could spend the day around metadata. Okay, but some some recommendation. Uh, okay, you need metadata and documentation to look at and understand research data. You easily understand that if we give you uh, directly uh, more recent data, we do not see unless you have some information. Okay, so really, it's something where you create metadata and think about what other will be like that. Okay, but was it my question on the exercise? I said, what? We didn't answer the question. Sort of what would you expect from the metadata? What would be useful for you? Okay, for, you, you know that there is a source of data and so on. What? And as I said, it would be great to, to automatically retrieve the data you want. So what would help you to, uh, to extract those data? If you want, what would work? I mean, you know, for example, uh, what, what aspect of the data that you need to give? Or... Exactly. So documentation, you, you, you need to know the format. Yeah. Okay? So that needs to be described. So, okay? You need to know the date. You, you, you are saying, okay, what you're interested in is to pick up the data for, this, for a certain date. Okay? The format, the description. Uh, all sorts of things. And this, is this is not the data, this is the data. 
But the gender is that we are doing that was mentioning and maybe have access to some sort of uh, service like you, you that or we sing, something like that. And how many? I mean, if you produce 20 papers a year, then you have access for everything. How many terabytes? It depends on what. <laughs> the volume, no, the vo you, you're totally right. Yeah. The volume is a question, and I take the example of the share you can call it. Well, there, there is a limit in the file size which is two gig two gigs two gigabytes for each data uh, data object. Yes but in life sciences you have terabytes. Not yes you have terabytes so then what you have is usually okay you have usually so communities are building their own data repositories and so on okay that's, but we can we can come back to that oh. one later on. But you're totally right, and that's part of the you know, part of the funding. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and well, I give you another example. It's high energy physics. Okay, the experiments yeah. they run at CERN, yeah. for example, they are producing petabytes. Yes. <laughs> okay. So there's a whole infrastructure to deal with those data, mm -hmm. to filter, to extract, to then. Uh, Okay. In, my, in my poor little exercise, I told you why. Okay, let's assume it. But it's an example of sensor. Sensor producing vast amounts of data is really okay. And there are more and more. You have some higher on some telescope that will produce yeah. petabytes and could be on something like that initially. So there are some large instruments. I mean, just in praise, we are building, we are building a part of the, 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 the praise services to try to build, put something together for large instruments data. <coughs> okay, just to go to, to metadata, so you really need to think about what order we need. Okay, the example of the metadata is that so you expect something which is well described. If it's well described, if the you you can you can reuse them. Okay, one well, recommendation is to work with others, okay, or do you understand what I mean and so on. And something important, use standards, okay. You have, and I didn't put that into the, into the, the presentation, but you have some uh, community-specific uh, metadata standards, and you have, you know, repositories where you have the, the list of available metadata sets and so on. So this is being developed, and this is being more and more described. Interoperable to this, this, this data can be sent to another uh, repository. It is uh, searchable from another repository. Yes. Uh, it, in this previous slide, I don't remember for five or uh, six slide four, you mentioned that it meant data formats. If that it was mark matrix and no data link, what this is. This yeah. yeah, the standard which key was the interrupt Yes. So usually, well, and usually most of the tools, are, well, as you said, we have a metadata format, okay, which is, but usually you can translate to one to, to the other pretty easily, to be called and so on. So, so tools can read them. But what I'm saying is it's standard. So it's a standard way to describe. So in life science data, I'm sure you have some. Uh, some specific uh, formats. In B2Share, there are already some <coughs> community specific metadata. Uh, you can, you know, that has been created and so on. So, there is some kind of standard that would be useful for others to understand. The cross community aspect is definitely complex. Okay, what would make that metadata good? So, the example of standards. A non ambiguous keywords, I have an example later on. Simple, complete, consistent, description, okay, so you can read that. The void special characters, yes, that's a good one. And the persistent identifier, we said. So this this is an example of, you know, if you use the if you use well formatted information or standardized information, you have all you, you I know you that there is a development of a new service, it's not the right one yet, which is Data type repository. So basically, that's the way you describe, a, you know, a date, uh, long format, and so on and so forth. Uh, this example is interesting. Okay, it's in Barcelona, Venezuela, and not Barcelona, which would be ambiguous. So these are examples. So I won't tell you much more about metadata. It's really a huge domain, but as you will see, 
putting the right level of metadata is crucial for the data to be shared. Okay, so something which is, uh, as I said, I said it's yes, I will come back to the, to the digital preservation. It's, there is something around, you know, it's more of a timeline dimension. Okay, when we talk about preservation in CNS, we are preserving some data or some documents for you know, 20, 50 years. So really the mandate is to say we have to <coughs> preserve that for such a long time. What is clear is that if you don't take any preservation action, okay, the understanding of the data, the usability of the data will decrease quickly and you will lose those data. So basically what are the challenges? Okay. The challenges are to set up so we said quality assurance procedures. They are not necessary, they are not only technical. Okay. They are for some aspect, but not only. To you know um, to, 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 to resist to some of the challenges. So a lot of content knowledge. Okay. That's really what the example I took a little earlier saying, well at some point you will the team will no more exist or after 10 years, 20 years, so we get retired, so on uh, and so on. So it's really important to have the right metadata. Okay, for, for when we want to uh, to preserve for a really long term, we have some uh, you know professional archivist that we did that we define that. Okay. File format obsolescence, that's the example, uh, C2 whatever uh, uh, Word 97 or what, what was the, the Word version we have lost 20 years ago? Will you be able to, to read those formats again? I'm not sure, or some um, you know, debase, debase string or whatever, data, database and things like that. Do you really believe you would be able to read that today? I'm not sure. So it is, uh, for example, it is a very interesting question because well, after the uh, uh, 15 or 25 years, uh, uh, no, nobody can you guarantee that you can read this PDF file and you know. And uh, if you need uh, uh, to <coughs> permanently change, uh, convert this uh, uh, old data formats uh, to the new one. So that's really so. That means that initially you need to select the right format, so definitely open format. So forget what. Microsoft Word is not open. Okay, so you well, you can expect okay, Microsoft might survive, but it's not good. So go with PDF. And even in on, on PDF, you have to be careful because some are now depreciating. Okay. So as I said, you, you have to clearly identify the format you use. Okay. You have to check that your document follows the format specification. And then, as you said, you have to go through migration when your format, you want to, your format gets obsolete. Okay. Um, storage media failure. Yes, you know that. You don't expect a, a CD to, to remain available for a long time, but it's the same with any tape, it's the same with all that. So, you know, usually you do, you, you, you have multiple, you have multiple copies, distant copies, and so on and so forth. So just those examples to tell you that those challenges are handled by some of the repositories, okay, you would have, but it's not as simple. If you talk about three, five years, okay, you really have to ensure that you have to, to avoid storage media failure, but otherwise it's not too bad. But uh, then for repositories and you know, thinking to dance in the Netherlands, what we do at CNES and so on. Uh, we have to carry on all those activities, all those uh, quality assurance activities. And just to give you an example of one certification, which is called Data Seal of Approval, which is uh, also uh, included into the UDAT, well, UDAT repository has to go through Data Seal of Approval, which is one level of certification, okay? Quite an initial one, but already good one. We have other type of uh, of certification that are worth uh, looking looking at when you want to select a repository. As I said, the uh, European Commission doesn't force you to use one specific repository, it asks you to select the repository. 
Okay, so <laughs> back, to, back, back to you, back to you, to the exercise. Quickly, so I said same. Uh, obviously, the same uh, project we are discussing. Uh, you see, I bring that you need open data. Okay, long term preservation. Okay. Obviously, you you can see, and that's one of the questions you, you, you raised earlier, that the, the input data source was trash data, even the, the actual or recent data, uh, trash data, or the, the forecast with recent data would be interesting for others than the, the city council employees. Okay, okay. Let's say that you have to use UDAP. You are suggested to use UDAP to share. There's no specific repository available. As I said, I described it to you already. Uh, so, based on the different data sets we have, okay, um, question is which of those data sets are worth publishing and or preserved? Okay, back to, uh, to this. So, which of them? We publish which of them we, we should preserve. The raw sensor data. No. It's, it depends. Like if it's small, then yes, maybe. It's, but if it's like too big, like one of it will be too big, especially if one doesn't prolong them. So it's yeah. Do you agree with that? Or? Yeah. Yes, definitely. It's probably it's probably out of the scope of your project here. Uh, as I said, it's huge. Okay. You can make them available. You can make them. Yeah, depends on the funding. Yeah. Depends on the interest and so on. But you're right. But you can always say, well, maybe some of the data are ours. Okay. Those one actual traffic. Yes. Yes. Okay. It's nothing. It's nothing huge. You want to to, to publish them and so on. Weather data. No. Yeah. Single, maybe, but not the simulation. Well, no, the weather, no, just the weather, just the weather data. Okay, but they're not in it because mm -hmm. we have to. Not, I think it, it should be stored somewhere where the weather starts. So we don't need. We need to charge exactly. for it's not your. It's not. It's not your problem. There is already an open data, so well, nothing is stopping you to record to give to provide some recommendation to the meteor if they don't provide the right level. Or, <laughs> <laughs> but it might be out of scope. Simulation results. Okay, so the result you would, you would produce are a worth publishing, preserving? Maybe city council. I think it should be because we need some statistics, build some possible records, something like this. Any yeah, other? Who, who could use that? Maybe we could use it in the future to do another analysis how our forecast works. Yes, well, and you have already that feedback loop. That feedback loop. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. and you can use like our uh, generated data as an input for analyzing how well we uh, forecast. I don't know. But also on, on, on Google Map, don't you appreciate with some kind of forecast? You know? Yes. Closing? Yeah. Someone else would compare our simulation results uh, with years. Okay. So yes, well, you definitely have to. Well, th there is interest in, in, in publishing that. Preservation, yes and no, depends. Okay, to be to be different, but probably a few years. After that's different. One thing is that those one, you can reproduce them. Basically, using because you have the code and so on. But the, one of the difference between those ones, those ones are the results from the sensor. You cannot reproduce them. If you lose the data, they are, they are lost. Those ones you could with during the simulation. Okay, that's, that's so, so, sometimes, I give you the example of the, in, in the climate simulation, semi type of simulation. I don't know if some of you are involved into that, but uh, they run in simulation, let's say semi, semi five. And they will keep the data for five to seven years. Because then, well, first of all, they will be able to rerun the simulation, and then there will be uh, CMIC6, and CMIC6, which is going through more detail, 
will replace that. So you don't need to keep them. However, any kind of radar, uh, you know, uh, data or the temperature and so on, but yes, you cannot reproduce them. You need to keep them. Okay, so this one's probably, for sure, you need to publish them. Will you publish them straight away? You start your project, you start your running your project, will you, will you publish such, such data straight away? No, no. Of course not. Yeah, obviously you need to have, to, to have some validation and so on. That's why you can go with some, what I said, the embargo. But you might want to publish <coughs> metadata to say, well, I'm interested, I can be interested in uh, to, to, to say to someone, yes, we are doing that. Maybe, maybe not. Okay, so um, that's really uh, what we have. So um, one of the things is, in terms of format, so we said, okay, let's focus really on the actual traffic and the forecasted traffic. Okay, so now we're going to try to make that a bit more fair. Okay. Follow the fair principles and so on. So let me show you. This is the extract of this force 11 uh, you know, link I provided you, which gives you the full detail of, of fair data and, and so on. Okay, I will show you that. So I said, okay. We said already who can access uh, preservation duration. We started to, to answer, but now. I said data structure, what, how would you structure or organize those? We, we have data, we talked about um, digital objects and so on, so any suggestion on how to, uh, to organize those data? We said the actual, the forecast, uh, traffic data. Just some suggestion. Okay, I'll show you the, the FAIR principle, okay, but okay, we don't. PIDs, metadata, format, okay, the protocol, protocol is pretty easy, but um, what would be required to make that, you know, really to publish those data? And for that to be efficient to, uh, you know, as a, as a research team, to uh, industry and so on. To the binder to this standard format, sorry, sign up. Yeah, well, no, no, sign up, sign up doesn't, no, sign up is just for weather. Uh -huh. But go to a standard format. Okay, so you can choose one of those. Yes, you have, you, have some, you have some formats, so basically you, you, what you would find for such data is you have a geographical, they, they would split that into a geographical data. Okay, you have format like shape, which is quite, quite used in that, in that domain. And then the, you know, the, the traffic data pointing to those geographical elements. Geographical element will point you to oh, this crossroad, for example, or this this uh, this uh, wall, this avenue. Okay, so that's where we said we have the that's really the format. Okay, for that to be interoperable. Then what would you need? Convert. Sorry. Something to convert. A tool to convert? Yes. Well, yes, you can provide that. You, you can, and by the way, you find that in some of the, on some, on some city open data. You're right. You have tools to read, to convert, to display, and that might not be total, fully your responsibility, but yes. Okay, uh, well, maybe let's go with, well, we will be running out of time. So I put some, some examples. So as I said, we, we focus on traffic and traffic data. In my sense, they are really the same data collection. Okay. It's really the same three two versions of the of the same data. And we can assume that because it's not something you would use directly. That's not really human. That wouldn't be directly used by human. Yes, you, you need to assume that it's used by a machine, and that's where you can provide something to visualize and something like that. That's, that's a good suggestion. Okay, so you publish them on B2Share, as we said, that will make them accessible. Okay, uh, yeah, as we said, actual data right now, forecast data, you can publish that with an embargo period and time to validate and so on. Okay. For some other simulations, which are not like that, that one, you would put an embargo until your paper has been uh, published and so on. Start 
standard or explicit format we said to be interoperable, to be uh, reusable also. Okay. Um, so the way you are to organize, so something you have to see too. I'll give you that example. You might want to group your data. If you take, uh, you know, if, you take, if each of the digital objects gather one hour of data, you have a huge number of digital objects that might not be useful. So you have to find the right uh, grouping. I would say to publish, uh, to publish the data. So maybe it's a week, weekly or monthly uh, data, so then you would publish the data, you know, actual traffic for the city for September uh, 2016. Okay. Uh, so you assign your PID and so on, and that's findable and accessible. No problem for that. Uh, the metadata, definitely, okay, you would do standard to share, try to find uh, other metadata. Uh, one thing important, embed the documentation, or put a reference to the documentation in each of your digital objects. It's not huge. The, the example get, uh, provided by Maurice can be useful. Okay. Something important, I really insist on this one. You need to create the, the metadata when you create the data. If you wait, that will never be done, and that will never be uh, reflecting the, the reality. And when we talk about running simulation, I mean, quite often, it will be so easy to include into your simulation the, you know, produce the data, but you also produce the metadata description straight away. Okay. It's most of the time you, have, you can use this template plus specifically what is the you know this, this specific data set and so on. So think to that when you run your when you create your simulation. Okay. So something important you might want also to publish uh, some documentation of your application, your applications themselves and so on. Okay. Be careful with the license, embargo obviously. Uh, if you publish your if you publish your, your application code, you can put universal PID metadata and so on. Does it support code revision? Does it support what sorry? Code revision. Like not not well, for example, not on B2Share. That's why I say you can but, but you can use it, you can provide you can publish on GitHub uh -huh. if you want. Here again, there's no okay, I took the example of uh, B2Share. Okay. But Whatever is the repository you want, you have to select the right repository based on your data. If you are, if you are, running, if you are, uh, if your simulation produces climate, you know, climate data, yes, you have ESGS, which is uh, no, because you mentioned that because there were two large files there, so that's why in GitHub the game there are small files. That's why. Yes. So if you can, you, you can provide them to just reference. Hey, the code is you know in the. You can put the reference into, the, into, your, um, into your digital object that the code was there. Or you can say, okay, you can, but it might be worse also putting the code you use for that specific to create, to, uh, create that digital object. That depends. Yeah. I can see where we have to. So, okay, the good of balancer depends a bit on your project, but some suggestions. Okay, data preservation duration, we, we, we discussed that already. Okay, so just just showing you that I, you can update the, the data flow diagram, okay? So it's the same way before. Here I'm thinking, well, okay, the reduce uh, sensor data, I can directly publish them into B2Share, into my repository, whatever it is, okay? And I would extract that. Maybe it's, that can be done, okay? You have a web front end or an API for citizen researchers in the street to, to search and include data. Okay, so, I don't have too much time, but just ten minutes, right? Sorry? Ten more minutes. Ten more minutes. Oh, no, let's go. I want to go. I will, will be able to read, but just wanted to present you the, the UDAT service because you know, I'm wearing a UDAT shirt, so I need to at some point. But no, it's a good example, and most of them are valuable. As I said, it's Available for research. So, 
you don't have developed and it's still developing a set of services that are covering the full web. A, to cover the full data life cycle. Okay? So basically you are sitting, you know, something quite generic, which is the B2 under, which is the PID management, so providing under PIDs. Uh, okay? And you have B2 access, which is a, a generic service you will use to authenticate your check access. Okay? So based on that, the services are B2 drop, which is some kind of a drop box, just to make it clear. Okay. I have some more B2 share we discussed. B2 save to a policy based data management is essentially to um, preserve a, a copy of some, uh, some repositories. B2 stage can be useful because the idea is to transfer data from the data storage to computation and vice versa. And B2 find will come back to that which is an aggregated metadata uh, inventory. Okay, and that can be quite useful. This slide, okay, well, just don't go into full detail, but you have different data domain, okay, workspace for private data. Probably at the beginning when you start working on the uh, on your project, okay, data for your team only. So they are private. Register data domain, which is a bit more, you start having PIDs and so on, so you can share the data. It might not be fully fully open yet. And then you have you open totally your data to reach the published uh, data domain. Okay, and that from there you can you can get, you can access the, the publication and you can uh, access some of your data. So you have one slide per um, that service. I won't go to the full detail, and you can find more a lot of explanation on the on the UBAT side. Just want to point that B two share. Which, so just working on B two share is based on the, the technology behind that is. In Veo, which is an, applica uh, an application developed by uh, CERN, which you will use, for example, in another uh, repository, which is called Zenodo, which you can find, which is not, not the user B2Share, but it's another, it's another one, you know, uh, funded by the Commission. Okay. Uh, b 2 said the data preservation. Usually, what you want to do is to, once you have a community repository, let's say a client, okay, they have their own repository, okay, and what they do with B2, with B2 safe is that they take copy, and you can take, you can make multiple copies of, across data centers and so on. So it's really around um, data replication, okay, thanks to archive and preserve data. Okay, bring data across to powerful compute resources. As I said, a lot of the of the data centers are also closed data centers. So it can be convenient to have your data close to the to avoid too many transfers. Okay. B2 stage is the transfer tool. Okay. It's based on green on green FTP, even if it's not uh, written here, but it, it deals with PIDs and things like that, so it's quite well uh, suited for the for the user data. This one is interesting. We said uh, we want to uh, you know you want to publish, you want to uh, make your data as open as possible. So B two five has been created really to uh, you know seek that object and push it. Really doesn't storing data, it only store metadata. Okay. And we'll go and harvest different metadata different data repositories. Okay. Using standard protocol, CCAM and things like that. So B2 file is available, it's running and so on, it's available for everybody. Meaning that if you have a repository which is different than which is not a UDAC repository at all. You can still get your metadata 
uh, uh, duplicating into that into that uh, tool and being searched by anybody. So the idea is to offer you know, cross community uh, search and so on. And as we were saying during the, during the break, we saw this morning that uh, in this thing you have uh, you have data repository. Yes. Okay. One one idea could be just to get your uh, your metadata harvested by B two five. So then someone would search your data and find them, and then that would point to your directory. So the one question: uh, Does it mean that uh, um, yeah, are we seeing that data sets are located in your website? No, no, yeah, no. They will remain. It's just the metadata. You just send the metadata, which is obviously totally uh, different. But it's cross uh, repository. And it's not the only the unique solution for that. But that's one which exists, which is free, and that's um, like. Okay, so I mean, just to conclude, I said, okay, what can we what can we say for the uh, to use you know preservation and metadata? So. In two words, so something that just represented that, uh, okay, that you can have, and that's implemented actually in B2Share, okay, but that could be done for other repositories, is that it's exactly the same in the, in the area, okay. You can have a replication of data and metadata to be safe, okay. This means that here it's really to secure storage and so on. You might want to access that, but it's not really for individuals you want to access that. But then you replicate your metadata into B2 file. Well, actually, it's B2 file. You come and harvest your metadata. Okay? And so anybody could do a, a search, okay, on metadata, okay, into that tool, and that would point him to, uh, to the relevant repository. Yeah, maybe I mean, yeah. we have also time for questions. So. Yes, and I'm, I'm around, well, we have to leave tomorrow quite early in the morning, so feel free to ask me a question uh, today. Please. Do you have any questions for open data government? Open data government? Government. Like, what? for example, in the state, there is such kind of problem where most states are publishing data. Yes. Um, so, uh, as far as I know, the focus has been more on communities and so on. This being said, uh, B2 file could be able to harvest some sort of this kind. Yeah, it's more research on the community versus uh, government. You know, the example I took of traffic and so on, existing France, and then in some of the big city uh, open data uh, portals, you have that in France. So as you know, something is more research oriented. So, uh, how large your data storage, which uh, you use for your services to store the data? Hundred terabytes, petabytes. Oh, it's, it's, I don't remember the exact figure. It's multiple petabytes. Thank you. Yeah. This being said, the petabyte. And how it's, much is cost to store? That's, 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 that's the right question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for this one. Um, that the, honestly, the price model is still uh, something to be worked between the Commission and the Center. So far, in the UDAT, UDAT is a project. Okay, so far, the second iteration of the project. And part of the project where you know, each center was uh, giving. A certain storage space, okay. 500 terabytes, 1 terabyte, one terabyte. So but it seems that you have that to learn what's going on. And usually, as we, there is a collaboration with the, co the communities, you have some agreements between the communities and the various centers, so that was fitting nicely. Now, if you want that to be sustainable in the future, then you need to have a way of funding. So there is. Um, The point is that you have a new project starting, which is the, the, 
the court just goes recently and so on, build something on the infrastructure of the UI. So it's quite complex. But there was the plan was also to have an agreement between the different sectors to offer some, some resources. But the funding, as far as I know, was not totally true. But we need some the commission. One of the one of the assumptions is that the commission as part of the funding of the project will fund some of the of the you know the storage space. So yeah, you cannot give you much more detail answer. Uh, but that's the tricky one. But I don't know if you have any other other projects if you have some. I know a little bit that of course the idea is that the publisher that earn money, you know, with the journals, that they give away a bit of that money and to also purchase storage for the data that is aligned with drawn. Of course the journals don't like that idea. But with the commission in the back and there's also the public authorities in Germany and beyond, other states they will force the publishers to make that happen. Because otherwise the scientists will not publish anymore in these journals where it's not the case. However, that is a long way to go because they'll be changing the mechanisms which was in place in these decades. But this is the only way where, I think, in some discussions where I've been part of, where it's a sustainable point because journals get money. And that's the only way where real revenue is, is actually coming into the whole space of publishing. Right? And this money needs to be given away to, to storage. Either then need to share, for example, would be connected directly at the publisher, so hosted at the publisher. Basically, um, this is an open question, or they outsource it to data centers which can do the job, but probably the, the money source will be there. Some other models where you could, as you could do now, if you open access journals, you pay more as organizations. So if you want to have a premium journal, which is you know more highly ranked in the site impact factor, you would give a premium gold journal, which is another model. And pay more so that they will create then a data repository for you that your data will be live with it. That was another model. So, premium, normal publication, and so on. And you get less credits for normal publication, but much more impact factor for, uh, for a higher, you know, this data publication. But all of this, as I began, I say, will take five, ten years probably to implement this in the paradigms where we're sitting at the moment. Uh, 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 you have to publish your scientific uh, papers or open access journals? Yes, again, there, there are these requirements coming to this. Yes, sure. It is a requirement that you, you have to publish your uh, scientific, scientific papers in open access journals, yes? It depends on project to project and funding of the organization ah. different. It is not totally. Right. No. Okay. Thank you. Is this also? Not yet, maybe. <laughs> but I could foresee, for instance, my brain works, I could also hear discussions. There is an absolute entity of publishing data. The organization still be very against this. While in other communities, it's completely open. Geosciences are very open to do this. So I think it's also communities that will go that way, and others that probably don't. We have to see about that. Yeah. And the European Commission is quite some based on projects and so on. You know, you can think to what we do for Trace. Uh, in Trace, you have some resources that are available for free based on you know scientific uh, reviews. And you might get that. The point is, I think, okay, even though the funding is not really sorted out. I think that building that management plan was developed in such a way okay, to, to explain why you need such and such resources, what would be the, the benefit for others and so on to do that. That's something important. Okay. And some you know, national funding, some national agency might fund some storage and so on. We we'll see that one more. Okay, to put the the, the, you know, the the storage and also the data services because you know it's not only it's not only storage. Uh, to put that into the, uh, to fund that as part of the, the, the proposals. I give you the, what I'm saying is, if you seem to be just uh, short term, the cost 
is essentially around storage. You produce some data, you just want to store just for your team, and so on. A bit of transfer, but essentially storage. But I gave you the example of really long, long term uh, data preservation. The cost is not, the essential of the cost is not the storage. It's really uh, yes, the, the, service, the service around that, the people around that. That's it. Thank you. No questions? Okay, uh, everyone, uh, the next session is the keynote by Zoe here. Uh, it's going to be in the next building, first floor, to, uh, as you go up the stairs, it's on the left. We start at 4, so please be there, leave here at 3.55 yeah. Yeah. to go to the other building, okay? And so get your stuff as well, okay? Because so after that, we're going to get the bus to go to the center, okay? Yeah, the last session. Yeah. This is human.